Hey everybody, welcome back. As you can see, I am not in my typical studio recording today. I am coming to you from vacation. I am out of town celebrating my birthday, but you know, I had to jump on here and give you guys the full breakdown of what has gone down this week in the Letitia Stalk trial. Not only because we're doing these trial recaps together and watching it as it progresses week to week, but because now we're at the end of it and we're going into verdict watch. And this week has been, I don't want to say underwhelming or so Low, but there weren't as many huge bombshells dropped that I think many of us were continuing to expect. But in a very weird curveball kind of way, a lot of the defense's expert witnesses who took the stand have now cast doubt in a lot of people's opinions who were so confident in saying that there's no way Letitia would get away with this. There's no way that she can run with this insanity argument because a lot of legal experts are now beginning to weigh in after the week that happened this week and the testimony that took place. And they have said that they're a little concerned now and that it's possible that could go that direction. So what I'm going to do is break down everything for you guys that went down this week in trial. Closing arguments have uh, have finished up, have closed up, have finished up, um, and we're going to just talk through as we now head into verdict watch next week. I can't imagine that the deliberation will be too, too long, so I'm thinking that we are going to have a verdict in within the next few days. So We'll see. All right, guys, let's break it all down together. My name is Annie Elise. This is 10 to Life, and I am coming straight out of Mexico, giving you this breakdown, and let's get right into it. Okay, guys, I am going to keep it real with you. I don't know if you have this problem, but I for sure do. I am like always trying to rack up credit card points because I follow all of these accounts about how you can fly these huge like primo suites on these aircrafts. All you have to do is get the points. So use this card for five points, use this card for 10 points, all of these things. And in my mind, when I'm doing it, I'm swiping being like, okay, I have the money to cover this purchase, but I'm going to use my credit card because then I'm going to get the points and then I'll just pay it off. And somehow it's like I'm not keeping track of what I'm spending. And then I get the credit card bill or bills at the end of the month and I'm like, uh oh, how did I even spend this much? I had no idea that I was doing this. What kind of game plan am I going to put in play to pay this off now? Well, luckily today's sponsor, PDS Debt, has customized 0% interest options for anybody struggling with credit cards, personal loans, collections, or medical bills. With a rising interest rate and the cost of living at an all-time high right now, it can be hard to figure out how to cover everything while also paying down past debts or credit card bills in my case. But now is the time to stop waiting and start saving with your own custom debt savings options from PDS Debt. If you're making payments every month on your debt and your balances aren't going down, this program is for you. PDS Debt rolls all of your payments into one low 0% interest monthly payment, so you can save thousands in interest and fees. Everyone with over $10,000 or more in debt qualifies, and there is no minimum credit score required. Bad and fair credit both are accepted. Now here's what's so great about this. PDS Debt is offering a free debt analysis to our viewers just for completing the quick and easy debt assessment at pdsdebt.com slash life. That's pdsdebt.com slash life. So guys, take back your financial freedom today and pay off your debt in a fraction of the time by visiting pdsdebt.com slash life. Now, I got a lot of travel points, but I gotta stop using my cards. Monday started week five of the trial, and to be honest, it was kind of a little bit of a glimmer of hope that we were nearing the end of this trial. The prosecution had one witness on Monday. It was an all-day event, and to be honest, a lot of it was kind of repetitive and things that we've already heard constantly over the last few weeks. But before they could bring up the witness, they had to handle some housekeeping issues. The defense dropped the bomb that on Sunday, Dr. Lewis, the expert witness for the defense, met with Letitia 
Georgia for three hours. The prosecutor was obviously annoyed and concerned because he felt like he needed to know what had gone on in that meeting so that he could cross-examine her. So after their little disagreement, court officially started. The witness called to the stand was Kevin Clark. He is the director of crime strategies and intelligence for the 4th Judicial District Attorney's Office. However, in 2020, he was working as an intelligence analyst for the Colorado Spring Police Department. He was qualified as an expert in cell phone data analysis and crime analysis. The first big thing that Kevin covered was a neighbor's ring camera footage. That footage caught Letitia backing into the driveway just after 2 p.m. on January 27, 2020. It did not catch her or Gannon getting out of the car because they sat in the driveway for too long and the neighbor's ring camera was motion activated. The ring also caught Letitia leaving for about 10 minutes on the morning of the 28th and again backing into the driveway. This was odd because prior to the 27th, which is the day that Gannon was reported as missing, Letitia never backed cars in. She always pulled them straight inside. After that, Kevin talked about some of Letitia's phone usage. On February 19th, Letitia used her third phone to make notes. In the notes app, it stated, in the case involving missing child Gannon Stauk, do you intend on telling the truth? In the case involving your stepson Gannon, did you inflict harm on him in any way? Did you accidentally hurt him in a physical way? Did you murder your stepson? Do you know personally who was involved with your stepson's disappearance? Now, my personal opinion on all of these searches, which we already know that she has just been like wild with her Google searches, with these, not searches, I'm sorry, but with these notepad entries, I believe it was because she was drafting those questions that she was sending to the fake polygraph company and saying that she answered and passed. I think this is where she was, you know, bullet lining everything that she was going to make sure was on that questionnaire so that she could essentially get away with murder. On the morning of February 21st, she searched fake polygraph tests. On the website she looked at, you can type in your own questions. So after talking about that, he jumped back over to the car history, which was more timeline stuff than anything else. And I don't know about you, but we've heard this timeline over and over. So I think that most of us are covered in that department. But then they jumped back to the phone history. The hard part of this trial, in my opinion, is the lack of order. It seems to jump around a lot, which is sometimes really difficult to follow, which is one one of the reasons why I'm hopeful that these videos are helping keep you guys all updated and clear on what's really happening. So back to the phones. Kevin testified about a text that Letitia sent Al late on Sunday night, January 26. Letitia said, Gannon was on the toilet most of the night upstairs and downstairs. He had a candle on earlier tonight because he said he kept smelling poop from his accidents in his pants. That's what he told us afterwards. And he went for his headphones and dropped it, then catching the covers and couch, small spot on fire. I got Lena and the dogs when we heard the fire alarm, but once I got down there to get him, I had to throw another cover on it. It was minimal, no need to call for help or anything because nothing too bad. He is upset and wrote on the notebook that he is sorry. He didn't want me to tell you because he was scared and freaking out about getting in trouble and being grounded. It's stuff we can fix and everyone is okay. I burnt my arm a little bit, but it's all good. He was more scared and embarrassed. Now, let me just first off and say, that is a very long-winded and detailed text. I get texting is like new age, everybody does it. I personally do it more than I should and, vo and I live and die by voice memos because I'm just not getting on the phone with people. But if there's a fire at the house and the sun had started and there's that much detail like she's including in the text, maybe a phone call is warranted or maybe you don't just send it in one laundry list text and you kind of break it out so it's more digestible. I don't know. It feels to me almost like she sent this message because she had rehearsed what she was going to say and how she was going to come across and then she just kind of rapid fire typed it all up, sent it to Al. I mean, it, it just feels kind of odd to me. That's just my personal opinion though. So Al never responded to this text, but once again, another lie from Letitia. The amount of candle stories that we've now heard by this point are absolutely insane. Letitia then tell, text Al again at 2.48 a.m and this was on the 27th as well, saying he's in the bathroom again and blood is coming out of the butthole and he is crying about going to school tomorrow. Like this is, he, like, like this, sorry, her typing is horrible. He is still upset about the candle accident. I told him it's fine and that as long as he's okay not to worry about something minor, we can fix and let's worry about his stomach hurting, which, sorry, sidebar, but you're not being the cool, calm, collected bonus mom here saying, I told him not to worry. I told him it's nothing serious because we heard the audio recording of you 
basically to like tormenting Gannon over this candle, saying how you guys were gonna have to sell things, how you were gonna have to move, all of this stuff. So like now don't try to play like you're the superhero bonus mom and like, but I told him it's okay, let's focus on his tummy. He's real he's not feeling well. I told him it's just damage, it's just a house. Like, get real, Letitia. So then she texted her work saying that her stepfather died and she wouldn't be in. But remember, that was also a lie. When her boss Leslie was trying to understand the plan and confirm Letitia was planning to take the day off, Letitia was super defensive with Leslie, saying, yes, that's my parent. I can't believe that you wouldn't be, um, you know, cooperative with that and that you would not be an assumption at a time like this. She's just seriously crazy and her grammar, I, I apologize, her grammar is just so horrible that it makes these text messages challenging to read. We've talked about this before. I don't know why she had to say that her parent had passed away. I don't know why she couldn't just say that her stepson was sick and that she was his sole caretaker that day. I mean, why create a lie that you then have to keep up with? It just makes no sense. So they read and showed more texts from that day, but none were really anything major. Kevin then stated that he believed Gannon was killed before Lena got home from school. Kevin read a bunch of texts from that night and thereafter. He confirmed that Letitia spent more time on social media than she did actually looking for Gannon on the night that she reported him as missing. On January 28th, Letitia texted Al saying, no one is ever supportive to step parents like they mean nothing when I've done beyond my part. So Al, obviously annoyed and confused, responded, oh my god, what are you talking about? Gannon is missing and you're worried about what people are saying to you? So the two of them went back and forth for a little bit. Letitia was clearly making it all about herself. She told Al that Gannon was with his friends and would come back after seeing the news, but Al seemed to be convinced that Gannon was long gone. And the saddest part of all of this was that he was right, except Gannon wasn't just long gone distance-wise. He was gone as a whole. The other major text messages shown here were Letitia's behavior about Landon. Letitia texted Al saying that Landon had asked if she could stay at their house, but she told her to ask Al. Al responded telling Letitia that she could stay and that in times like this, they put their differences aside. To which Letitia said, okay, I don't agree, but it's your choice. And then started sending a follow-up message saying, please don't change your plan because I want you guys to be able to be together, but I'm probably going to stay somewhere else. So Al just quickly responded with, okay, then do that. So clearly he was already over her selfish behavior. As a parent, his first priority was finding his son, not stressing about, out about sleeping arrangements, but obviously Letitia didn't need to stress about finding Gannon, so she had the time to worry about the mundane, dumb things that shouldn't matter in the middle of a family crisis. There's no room for jealousy in these kinds of moments, lady. The last thing Kevin showed that day was more Google searches, and let me just tell you, they were wild, continued to be wild. She had over 6,000 Google searches. The searches included hiding IP address, need a fake ID legit, multiple searches about face transplant and plastic surgery, what to do when they find a body in another state, how do they identify bodies found in another state, Spanish girl names, how long before a body starts to decompose in a bag, how to avoid the FBI, criminally negligent homicide in Colorado, can God help me escape jail time, fake a call from Mexico drug cartel, find an immigrant who will admit to a crime, and then shock from watching someone get shot. Which all I can say here, if nothing else, is that those searches basically show her guilt in my opinion. But regarding the Spanish girl's names, the face transplant and plastic surgery searches, part of me wonders if she she was for sure trying to change her identity. Maybe she was planning to go on the run to change her identity, but then never got around to it. The search about finding an immigrant who will admit to a crime is also just disgusting and gross because no, Letitia, no one wants to admit to a murder that they didn't commit. Another odd thing that I found in that search was shock from watching someone get shot. If she were truly searching that because she felt she was in shock after shooting Gannon, why wouldn't the search be shock after shooting somebody? But the fact that it was shot at shock after watching someone get shot makes me wonder, is it possible that either Harley or Lena, whenever Gannon was shot and killed, bared witness somehow. Because again, and that could just be me getting hung up on a minor detail, but if she was speaking to herself being in shock, I would imagine that the question in Google would have been shock from shooting someone, not from watching someone get shot. But you tell me what you think. Throughout the day, Letitia was seen mouthing things to her and her attorney, and they were being absolutely disrespectful in court. She kept making heart signs with her hands, and she and her attorney were laughing in the middle of court, and she was mouthing things like, I love you, and happy birthday to Harley throughout the day. It was very bizarre. Her attorney laughing with her just makes me sick. There is nothing for them to be laughing about. They are there because 
this 11 year old boy was violently murdered by her and it's as if they have zero class at all. The last thing for Monday was the discussion of the three hour interview Dr. Lewis had with Letitia on Sunday. During that meeting, a high school softball injury that Letitia sustained was discussed. That accident knocked out teeth and Letitia got a concussion. The prosecutor was worried about cross-examining, that he had no clue about the meeting and that the accident had not been disclosed in her initial report. So eventually it was decided that if there was nothing in the initial report about that softball injury, then it could not be discussed. Tuesday, day 18 started with the prosecution resting their case as soon as the jury entered the room. The judge explained that the prosecution has presented all of the evidence that they felt would prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the charges against Letitia are proven to not be insanity. He said that the defense has the opportunity, but not an obligation, to call their own witnesses and can choose to do so or not. When asked by the judge if she has decided whether or not to testify on her own behalf, Letitia and her attorneys said that she would make a decision after their expert witnesses were finished testifying. So the defense decided to call some witnesses of their own. And first on the stand was Dr. Rhonda Niederhauser. Niederhauser, I apologize. She's a clinical psychologist at Fort Carson and Evans Army Medical Hospital. She works mostly with dependents and family members of people in the military who have mental health issues such as anxiety and depression. Dr. Niederhauser saw Letitia on in back in December of 2019 while working as a behavioral health consultant. She said that at the time Letitia complained of having constipation and suffering from anxiety and stress due to her work as a teacher. After a depression and anxiety screener went through, she had suggested that she take hydroxine for her anxiety and to start attending therapy. In her second visit with Letitia, the doctor explained that her anxiety was starting to be relieved after she decided to get a different job in another school district. In cross-examination, the prosecution confirmed that anxiety was the only thing that Letitia was struggling with, and she confirmed that she didn't treat her for once for anything else, didn't treat her or notice any other issues but the anxiety, which it seems like a strange choice for the defense to call a witness to testify that the only mental health issue that Letitia seemed to have was anxiety. That doesn't really help their case of insanity, in my opinion. The next witness to be called was Dr. Dorothy Lewis, but she was late to court due to a supposed scheduling conflict. There was almost a three-hour break waiting for Dr. Lewis. When she arrived, the first thing she did was go over her undeniable accomplishments that she's had over her long career in psychiatry. She graduated from Harvard University before attending medical school at Yale and graduating in 1963. At this point, she is semi-retired, but will take specific cases due to her expertise in the field, especially with cases dealing with potential DID or other insanity pleas. Dr. Lewis had taught at several prestigious universities, written books about DID, and even had an HBO documentary about her life as a psychiatrist prior to all of this and being a pioneer for DID diagnoses in criminally insane people. She's written many groundbreaking medical journals and peer-reviewed articles, and it's obvious that she has had a lot of success in her life as a doctor. However, the prosecution had a problem with deeming her as a credible witness because she does not hold a Colorado license. Dr. Lewis stated that she has licenses in other states and it would be difficult and expensive to obtain a license in every single state, especially since she is basically retired. You licensed to practice medicine in the state of Colorado? No. Are you licensed to practice psychiatry in the state of Colorado? No. Are you licensed to conduct forensic examinations on defendants charged with criminal cases in the state of Colorado? I believe I'm recognized as an expert and permitted to do that, but I am i don't have a license in Colorado. I've, I've tried to maintain, for the most part, maintain licenses where there is reciprocity. And all these states where I have mentioned, I'm not licensed in each of them, but usually on the basis of places where I, I've for years, I continued having a California license, a New York license, and a Connecticut license because uh, they tended to be reciprocally recognized in other states. And hence, I could uh, testify there, but I do not hold a license in each of these states. And indeed, I'm now just retaining my New York license because it's fairly expensive to have a license in each state and uh if should i need to i can uh you know i can reapply and there is reciprocity usually so we're clear the answer to my question was no well the answer is i don't have a license here no but i am 
I've been permitted to uh, testify in cases in states in which I do not maintain a license because it would mean 50 licenses. So after she was recognized as an expert witness, the defense went on to ask Dr. Lewis to explain her definition of DID based on her years of experience. And I'm not going to lie, Dr. Lewis probably has a million interesting stories to tell, but it's been a long trial and this lady is long-winded to say the least. A few times she took up to three minutes to answer a simple yes or no question. There, I can tell you what it seems to be and uh, the way in which I understand it now, we do not have a good understanding of the physiology of it, of the, you know, the way in which the chemistry of the brain works. We don't have a perfect understanding of the way in which the neurotransmission works. There's a lot more to learn about it. But it looks as though, uh, first of all, we do seem to know what causes severe uh, dissociative disorders. Uh, when very young children, even infants, are subjected to early, ongoing, relentless uh, physical, where it is intolerable, where you, it just, you can't uh, cope with it anymore, the mind seems to self-hypnotize. Now, colleagues of mine would maybe use different terms to, uh, to mean the same thing, that where you kind of self-hypnotize, and it is as if this were not happening to you, it's as if it's happening to someone else. You know, this is probably one of the reasons why it is very, very hard for, uh, for clinicians, not just for lay people who have not trained in this, but for clinicians to believe that this is possible, because it, it is so uh, unbelievable in many ways, it, but it, it does occur. And it, it could, ex, could that explain a situation where, well, specifically in this case, Ms. Dow commits a horrible, violent act, and then only hours later is appearing very charming and interested in finding Gannon to the police. The defense asked Dr. Lewis if any of those components of DID could be what Letitia was experiencing. She explained that through her research on the case, she found information from social workers and various family members about Letitia's childhood. Uh, several people seem to agree that, uh, first of all, that she came from an extraordinarily violent household, including that, well, that of her mother, Deborah, no. and her mother's tendency to latch on to males in her environment who were extremely <laughs> but also a <laughs> to, um, to Leticia as well. Uh, there was one, uh, one man in the mother's life who apparently pushed Leticia into a shower and beat her naked in the shower. It was the, these kinds of grotesquely uh, physically, and I would call that sexually as well as physically. Also, uh, there were several of her relatives who, uh, who spoke about, um, oh, aunts, uncles, uh, great, great aunts and uncles known as grandparents or whatever, who, uh, who gave her animals repeatedly. By the way, this is a question that not a whole lot of psychiatrists ask, but it's very important because it's one of the commoner ways that occurs in uh, kids. Well, so, in, in, in fact, she detailed a, a it was actually an uncle, but it was actually her grandfather, detailed to you being given enemas by him almost on a daily basis. Do you recall that? I, it, do you recall her describing that to you, of a grandfather giving her enemas almost on a daily basis? I do. And uh, I recall her saying this. And also I recall, if I'm, I think I'm not mistaken, that she also gave enemas to Gannon. And she also perceived this as something he wanted her to do. Uh, so that uh, it, uh, it certainly has a second... Uh, as well as a of quality.
But she did not perceive these daily enemas as being sexual in nature as far as when they were given by her grandfather, correct? Objection, leading. I don't know. Spade. Jury will disregard the answer. Do you know if she perceived these enemas as sexual that her grandfather gave her? I don't know. Not that I'm shocked by anything that Letitia does anymore, but I was a little surprised hearing about the enemas and the possible correlation between her experience and giving Ganon enemas. I always felt like it was kind of weird anyway, but I didn't really think of it as any sort of kind of assault type scenario. But that kind of makes a lot of sense to me at least. But tell me what you think. Even if Letitia doesn't have DID, there are some victims who may want to inflict the same type of harm they experienced, and I honestly honestly wouldn't put it past her. When Dr. Lewis interviewed Letitia, she said it appeared that Maria had a Russian accent and that she was the harsh, angry, and harmful entity in Letitia. She said that when she spoke with Maria, she felt like she was talking to the person that actually killed Gannon. When Dr. Lewis was asking why some people might have never even perceived Letitia as having DID or encountering some of her alters, she said that it's not unusual for alters to distinguish who they allow themselves to be presented to. She said that Gannon starting the fire must have impacted or triggered Letitia due to a possible fire in her childhood, and that after she started to see her stepfather James. She talked about how there was an incident at school where Letitia was working and a bookshelf fell on her head and knocked her out. This, or maybe another instance, could have caused brain damage, which would explain a lot of Letitia's behavior. Dr. Lewis said that a lot of her behavior is consistent with someone with brain damage, and she wanted an EEG done on Letitia's brain to rule that out. During cross-examination, the prosecution asked Dr. Lewis for Colorado's legal definition of insanity. What's the legal definition of insanity in the state of Colorado, doctor? Oh, uh, I believe that you must, uh, I'm, uh, you must know the, uh, the nature of what you have done and that it was wrong. And uh, that uh, also, I think that you do add on a um, a bit of the Durham decision, which has to do with uh, if you cannot control the uh, your behaviors, such as to comply with the requisites of law. I believe that that is also part of an insanity defense here. Did you look at the statute regarding insanity for the state of Colorado prior to rendering an opinions in this case? I did, but I would have to look at it again to look at it. And I've also discussed it with others, which is why I added the uh, the Durham decision and the ability to conform your behavior. Because to my mind, in many, in many courts where I've testified, that is no longer accepted. But it's it was my understanding from the attorney that that is also an an aspect of insanity, the inability to conform your behavior to what is required by law. Is that the aspect that you use in rendering your opinions in this case? That is only one of the aspects. Of well, tell us the elements. This is what you're here for. You're here to testify that this defendant was sane at the time she committed this crime. I'd like you to explain to the jury now what law you used in rendering that opinion? If you if, would you permit me to read it, and I will tell you for what aspects of it I you're the expert concentrated doctor. on. I, uh, by and large, I used the a McNaughton definition of whether the person knew the nature of what he or she was doing and that it was wrong. Now this is where things get a little sketchy. When Dr. Lewis said that she believes Letitia was and is insane, the prosecution asked her to explain how she came to that conclusion. She said that she usually gets an EEG and an MRI, and she begged the court to get those for Letitia, but it was refused. She said that the defense told her that the court wouldn't pay for those tests to be done, and she'd never experienced a court that denied those requests. However, the prosecution called out the defense and said that that really was wasn't the case. You wanted an MRI done, an EEG done, as well as a neuropsych exam with some several tests that you listed in your report, correct? Right. And you wanted those done before you rendered an opinion as to insanity in the state of Colorado, correct? I wanted it before I testified, yes. And none of those items got done? No. Yet you still issued a second report claiming that she's insane without any definition of why she's insane. 
Well, I gave you the, the definition that she is psychotic and gave you the data to show it, but I did not write it in the form in which I would if I had all of those data to include in it. And I did not have them. And, uh, you know, I, I could not include what, as it was my understanding that the court refused to finance the EEG and the MRI and the neuropsychological testing. Now, so I gave you as much as I could from let's what- Let's talk you about that. Um, on October 13th, 2022, you were scheduled to come testify to this court about why you wanted an EEG and MRI done, correct? You recall that? No. What, uh, say that again? Do you not recall being asked to come testify with regards to why you needed an EEG done and an MRI done in this case? I, I do not know what you are referring to. I have no idea what you're what you're referring to, because you, I, I would have been pleased to at least talk on the phone to the judge or or whatever. Uh, I I begged to have these things done. I can only tell you that, and I would have spoken to anyone who wanted to talk to me about it. Well, you were contacted well before February 2022 on this case, correct? Absolutely. And you were contacted before Ms. Stout pled not guilty by reason of insanity, correct? Right. And she pled not guilty by reason of insanity on February 11th of 2022, correct? I'm assuming your dates are correct, yeah. And you didn't do anything on this evaluation until November of 2022? I worked as hard as I could to get these. In fact, I called the neurologist for free, Dr. James Merikangas, to discuss the case because I could not get funding from this court to get these tests done. So I called and discussed it with him. I contacted Catherine Yeager, Dr. Yeager, the neuropsychologist with whom I've worked for 30 years, and worked with her and spoke with her and got as much data as I possibly could. And I, and I begged uh, her attorneys to get this. And their answer was that the court would not pay for those tests to be done. I and I had never heard. In fact, I said I've never heard of this before, but I, it did not occur to me to pick up the phone and to call the the judge. I didn't even know who the judge was, but I was told I could not get this and that I must get something in by then. So I didn't even call my initial contact uh, a uh, complete report on it. But I'm. I'm trying to see what I called it. I called it initial, uh, I think, initial psychiatric impression, right? Right, yeah, because you wanted that information before you rendered an opinion as to insanity, correct? That is true. And, you know, at this time, I'd like the court to take judicial notice that on October 13, 2022, uh, the request to have an EEG done, an MRI done by defense was withdrawn, and we did not go to hearing on that. Mr. Tulaney? Defense position. The court will take judicial notice that on October 13 of 2022, the defense withdrew its request for an EEG in this case. As well as MRI. As well as an MRI. Were you ever told that? This is news to me right now. So. Dr. Lewis said that those tests would have been extremely valuable in showing whether or not Letitia suffered any brain damage or activity, and it would have made the defense's case much easier to prove. Uh, Mr. Tolini would have a lot easier case if he were able to document that a lot of her signs, symptoms, and behaviors are the result of abnormal electrical activity. And or, as in a recent case that I did, Early, I think. And, and last Doctor, fall. I'm going to stop you there. Uh, Let me stop you there, uh, Doctor, because I, I want to stick to my questions here. Okay. The EEG or MRI could have showed nothing as well, right? No right. brain damage. That's right. And that would also help you in forming your opinion as well, wouldn't it? Well, it certainly would not have confirmed a, a neurologic, a documented neurologic dysfunction. 
And so all you had to go on is really uh, Ms. Stouk self-reporting to you in the forensic interview that you conducted. Well, I, that's a simple. I can't go along with that. That's all we had. Mm -hmm. But we did not have the additional neuropsychological and neurological data that I would very much have liked and I would still like. And I had no idea that this was ever withdrawn. It was my idea, or it was my understanding, that the court had refused to grant the funding to have these things done, which in my experience is a first. Well, now you know what happened, though. So why do you keep saying you know what happened? I don't. The court just took judicial notice that the defense withdrew their request. I know what you're telling me, but it would be presumptuous for me to say, I know now. Uh, you've put me in the middle of a debate that I can't enter into. So that kind of has to make you wonder why the defense lied about the court refusing the tests and why they didn't want Letitia tested. Is it because they know the tests would not have shown anything? It kind of seems like they requested for one of the biggest proponents for DID and to come and to diagnose Letitia based on her word alone and then not to allow any other actual data to corroborate Dr. Lewis's impression. She also asked who she could speak to who knew Letitia and said that she she wasn't permitted to talk to any of her family members in person like Harley or Al. She was only able to read the report that the defense prepared for her. But even without the tests, she still believes that Letitia is insane and didn't know right from wrong. But insanity in your report, you say, best, based upon the evidence that I reviewed, in my opinion, Miss Stock was insane at the time of the homicide and the days following, period. That's right. Uh, and I believe that at the time she was psychotic. And whether you use the uh, McNaughton definition, whether you use the Durham decision or a variation of it, she was psychotic at the time. I believe she did not know what she was doing. I don't, I'm not certain she even knows that she did do it now as we speak. Okay. And uh, that, that it was wrong is uh, uh, if she doesn't know that she did it, it, uh, the question of whether or not she knows it is wrong is, uh, you know, is something that can be debated. But uh, I think that she does not appreciate the nature of what she did uh, or that it was wrong and that she is guilty of having of having murdered again. When the defense was finished with their questions, there was a hot mic and you could hear that the Dr. Lewis felt like she was being lied to by the defense. What do you make of that? He, he, he lied. I don't know exactly what's going on here, but the defense just seems like they're up to something with this witness. First, their little secret meeting on Sunday, and then they supposedly told her the wrong time to be there in the morning, lying to her about the tests, not requesting tests that could have helped their case, and so much other stuff it seems like they withheld from her. I know that Dr. Lewis is a world-renowned and respected doctor, but she even said herself that she had gotten it wrong in the past. And I think Letitia and the defense might have duped her on this one. Court started on Wednesday with cross-exam and Dr. Lewis let the prosecution know that she had been suffering from food poisoning. The prosecution wanted to start with talking about DID. She explained that the real controversy is whether people believe DID exists or not. When she asked how she knows if someone is acting or not, Dr. Lewis explained that she likes to show that there were unmistakable signs of switches, changes, or different states and abilities to function long before she gets involved in a case. Shortly into her testimony, Dr. Lewis's phone went off and she was unable to find it in her purse and the attorney had to help her and get it turned on silent. She then explained that Letitia herself has a history of wanting to be called Maria as a child. She said it was a relative that told her that, but that she wasn't able to say which relative told her that. It was not in any part of her report, it was just in her notes. The prosecution was basically arguing with her that it must have not been super important considering Dr. Lewis didn't add it to her report and only began talking about it on Wednesday. Wednesday. She also previously testified that she's never interviewed anyone else, so that really wouldn't make much sense. When the prosecution questioned why no one around Letitia, especially her family, had seen another personality, she said not everyone has the ability to recognize DID. A lot of the cross-exam responses from Dr. Lewis were full of I don't knows, coupled with a ton of ramblings on. When they asked Dr. Lewis about Letitia switching between three separate weapons, and if that shows that she has the capacity to inform the intent to kill, Dr. Lewis said, I don't
don't know, and that she couldn't be certain what was going through her head. When asked if Letitia knew right from wrong when she drove Gannon's body to the airport, Dr. Lewis said she couldn't speculate on that. The prosecution laid out a ton of conscious things Letitia did and asked if they were evidence that she knew right from wrong. Dr. Lewis' answers were basically, I don't know, on every single one of those acts mentioned. When talking about the Eduardo story, she told the prosecutor, I find crazy what you find logical, and told him that the whole story of Eduardo was crazy. Throughout the day, Dr. Lewis kept saying things about Letitia loving Gannon. The prosecution kind of tripped her up and called her out at one point right before they played the interview videos. The whole trip to Florida, do you see any evidence of psychosis or any evidence that she didn't have the capacity to know right from wrong during that trip? I have to say, I, I see neither the capacity nor a lack of capacity there. It's, uh, it's to my mind, it's incredibly peculiar behavior to, to drive that distance at, with a body and the body of a child that you allegedly loved uh, in the back of your car. There is a... Uh, I'm glad you used the word allegedly there because you're familiar with a uh, search that she did on her phone that was later deleted by her that says, I don't like my stepson. Remember that search? I, uh, I'm aware of the statement, I don't like my stepson. Kind of contradicts what you've I been saying, though. Uh, I think I only became aware of that once, but it could have happened again. I don't know. So... She takes Gannon's body and dumps it over a bridge in Pensacola. That evidence that she has the capacity to know right from wrong when she once again is hiding Gannon's body. Again, I don't know if that shows she knows right from wrong. And then his body was discovered on March 17, 2020 by a Macon Ponder. Do you remember reading about that? I remember reading that it was found. A bridge inspector who inspects that bridge every two years just happened to be there on March 17, 2020, and he finds the suitcase. Okay. No. If that suitcase is never found, do you think we'd be here today on an insanity case? I, I can't answer that. I, I don't know. Then they played some clips of Letitia's sanity evaluation with Dr. Lewis in November of 2022. Letitia says she calls her attorney Josh, but that Maria calls him Pendeo, which is like a-hole in Spanish. She also talks about how her personality switched during stress. I'm glad I already apologized. I'm not a part of it. You're not a part of it. So, I have a suggestion. Maybe you can do so like what happened is something really happened, happened to her that like really stressed out. I um, was I can be at like work and be okay and something stressful will happen and then I'll just end up right somewhere. No, end up in play. Do you know how you got to play? It's like my body comes through the motions. Like obviously I got to get a passport by taking it from yeah. that. I don't really remember doing all of it. You don't remember it all. I know it sounds crazy. But well, it does not. But like, okay, so like, if you see my credit cards by me, and you go, oh, okay. Obviously she did it, because obviously it's under her, my name is easy to, and my body's got to know that's who's a credit card, and you got phones to be able to pay for it, but yet at the same time, like, I won't know I've done it, so I'm on the plane, and I'm like, oh, okay. I'm going to this place or I'm going to that place. You find yourself where not being on the plane. I did it a lot. It was in the past. Like, um, just drinking wine. I'm like, oh, I didn't even remember when it's my bottle. Mm -hmm. Simple things like that. All the way up until being in another country. I met that a lot where my daughter's even texting me. I'm like, Mom, it says you're in the middle of the ocean. I'm like, oh, I am. Because, and where are we going? Letitia told Dr. Lewis that she did not intentionally hurt Gannon, saying she loved him and Lena, which, sure, Letitia, if you really loved him, you would not have done that. In the middle of all of these videos, the judge said that Dr. Lewis was no longer allowed to use her notes and could only use what is in her report. There was an email that gave the defense permission to withdraw the EEG request. Dr. Lewis testified that she did not request to withdraw it and said that they could wait to do it. But when they 
showed the email to her. The email she wrote specifically said, I have been reading more on Letitia and I think we should drop the EEG request. So this was very different from on Tuesday when she said she did not request that and blamed it all on the defense. In the nicest way possible when I say this, guys, this doctor is 85 years old. And I really think she probably should retire if she is not able to accurately write everything in her reports instead of notes and then cannot even keep track of what she wrote in emails. In fact, she actually did not write her own report at all. She sent her notes to the defense, who then typed up her report. She signed off on it as Dr. Lewis, and also had Letitia sign documents in all of her alters. These documents had allegedly gone AWOL, according to the defense, but the prosecution wanted to make sure that they were actually lost and wouldn't show up later. But lo and behold, she later showed up with a stack of documents in her lap. So they had to be put under a seal because nobody had seen them. It has been incredibly disorganized on Dr. Lewis's side, and in my opinion, the defense really did not do a good job choosing their expert witness. They went back to playing more footage of Letitia. Letitia seemed to be jumping in and out of her alters in this evaluation footage. At some points, she was even talking fake Russian in her alter Maria. This Maria alter said that she was trying to protect the people in the house, and then said, I'm trying to kill, that's what I do. And then said, I took the gun and fired it at someone who had a cape on, a dangerous man. She was essentially referring to Gannon as this dangerous man but he was literally an 11-year-old boy. After they played that section of the evaluation, they talked about what was seen at the end, a man exiting the rooms. As it turned out, it was Dr. Lewis's son. She said that he was there to help her work the cameras. Then they played the last section for the day, which was an hour and a half. There was a confession written in Latin by Maria. This whole clip was basically the Maria Alter explaining to Dr. Lewis that she killed Gannon. Letitia had zero knowledge of the killing or how Maria disposed of Gannon's body. After they stopped playing the video, Dr. Lewis was unable to find that confession note. The overall theme of the whole testimony of Dr. Lewis is that she doesn't have all of the information to diagnose Letitia with DID, but she does believe that she was in psychosis at the time of the crime. The EEG is something she needs for a DID diagnosis. So the fact that she told the defense to withdraw the request for the EEG is honestly a clear indication that this should absolutely be the last professional thing that Dr. Lewis ever does. She essentially got chewed up and spit out, and this is not the first case that that has happened to her in. The audio for all of Wednesday was horrific, and in the last few minutes of court, it was completely out. Letitia decided not to testify on Friday, and the defense said that they would rest Friday as well, right after closing statements. So as I mentioned, not what? A ton of huge things. It's mainly Letitia continuing to push this narrative of her alters, this Maria character, then their expert witness for the defense who just kind of fumbled multiple times in my opinion. However, because she is saying that Letitia was in a state of psychosis, but that DID is perhaps off the table, a lot of experts are weighing in saying that perhaps she was in a state of psychosis. Perhaps she does have a level of insanity, even if that not is not DID itself. And not multiple personalities. She still could have had a psychotic break or something of that degree. I personally disagree with all of that, but again, I'm not an expert. I think that this was calculated. I think that this was premeditated in a sense, and I think that Letitia is very lucid. Maybe that's what we start calling her. Instead of greasy Letitia, maybe it's lucid Letitia, because I do not believe that she was insane. Do you? I think that her movements and the way she moved like a snake immediately following the murder proves that she was trying to be smarter and trying to keep ahead of other people. It doesn't scream to me somebody who suffered a psychotic break maybe has remorse, maybe doesn't. It just seems way too calculated for me. So what do you think? So closing statements happen on Friday. Nothing really major from there. Just each side of them, of course, pushing their version of events and what they truly believe and who they believe Letitia to be. And we're going to go into verdict watch. I would imagine we'll have it within the first couple days of the week, if not sooner, because like I said at the beginning of this video, I can't imagine that it's going to be a long deliberation, but we'll see. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Do you think that the verdict will be guilty not by insanity? Or do you think that she will be found guilty by reason of insanity? What do you think and why? 
let me know. We will be on Verdict Watch together as we continue to watch this unfold, and we also still have Lori Vallow in the courtroom. I still have my one of my researchers on the team. She's staying there for a second week. She's been in the courthouse every single day watching that trial go down, so there's definitely not going to be any shortage of court trials and recaps even following the verdict in this case, but I'm just hopeful that we get a verdict that serves justice for Gannon and allows all of Gannon's family to move on in a peaceful way and get some, some semblance of closure and accountability and I hope Gracie Letitia and Lucid Letitia and Mystery Maria are all locked in a cell for the rest of their lives or imaginative lives whatever it is um, all right guys thanks for tuning in with me again I will be back in my studio for the next video but coming to you straight out of Mexico here it's beautiful it's sunny and I'm going to now go finish celebrating 36 all right guys thanks so much for tuning in with me today and until the next case stay safe bye